I'm going to call up the roll now for the subcommittee on conference. Council Naomi Zabit. Present. Councilor Judith Garcia. Present. Councilor Todd Taylor is present. Councilor Giovanni Recupero. Councilor Leah Robinson is present. Councilor Calvin Brown. Present. Councilor Damali Vidal. Present. Councilor Melinda Maldonado is absent. Councilor Yamir Rodriguez. Here. Councilor Roy Virginia is present. Councilor Enya Lopez. Here. Okay. So we have now. Let me just put myself. Ten present, one absent. We're going to open up with the um, school committee. I'm sorry, not school committee. School department, and we have with us uh, Superintendent Almi Alveda, and we'll give you the floor. And if you want to go over uh, the school committee, the, the budget that was approved by the school committee. Sure, we'll try to make it pithy. Um, thank you, um, Chair and members of the City Council and City Manager um, Ambrosino for having us this evening. Um, I, I have our uh, Budget and Finance Director with us, Monica Lamboy, as well. So I'm going to frame everything and then I'm going to turn it over to Monica to go over numbers. So it is a, the vision of Chelsea Public Schools. Um, we are a gateway school system that welcomes and educates all students and families. And so I just thought I'd put in some highlights here. Um, some of the work that we're most proud of is the work that we've done with our e English language learners. And we know that if we can educate our English language learners, we can educate all students. And so this past MPAS, we um, improved by 13 points, showing substantial progress, which is huge, considering the amount of English language learners that we have. Another bright spot is in our math at the high school. We grew by 19 points on MCAS this past year. And so that just shows that our trajectory is on the right path. So me coming in as a new superintendent, I'm coming into a solid foundation that I can build upon and move the work to the next level. And so that's what we plan on to do. Um, as you know, we started our budget process a while back, probably in January. It's been a long couple of months. And when I started, we were, had the joy of maybe having the Student Opportunity Act. Um, there was a lot to plan for, many community hearings. We had four in the, in the fall and then another three in the winter time. And we gathered a lot of community input. We had survey and then COVID-19 hit us. And we ended up having to build a budget. We were completely done with our budget. And then the crisis came and our budget is now $11 million uh, shy. <laughs> so with that, we did our best. We, we thought, okay, what can we do to, be, to present the best budget to our school committee? So we presented a level budget. It seems like the most logical thing to do in light of the fact that at this moment in time, we still do not have final budget numbers from the state. As we sit here, we are still waiting for budget numbers. And we are hopeful that a leveled budget will be sufficient. And even with a leveled budget, I'm gonna have Monica go through that. We are still two point, it was 2.2 million shortfall. And so we figured that out. We made adjustments and balance where we needed to with preserving the classroom, because I strongly believe that we have to preserve at all costs, our teachers and our classroom. And so this budget reflects that, and that's what you will see. So we made decisions with integrity. We're not starting any new initiatives. We're gonna continue with the initiatives that we have. And we believe that this budget reflects good stewardship and taking care of our prized possessions, which, which is our teachers and our employees. And so I will let Monica take it from here. Is this an extra? It is so. an extra, absolutely. Good evening, I'm Monica Lamboy, Director of Administration and Finance. So you see some of the beautiful artwork that we've had from our students, but following um, the artwork, 
Um, just to refresh, I know everybody knows this, but funding for public education comes from enough, a number of different sources. The single largest is Chapter 70 state funding, which is the funding the superintendent says we are uncertain about. Um, the city of Chelsea provides us a substantial amount of resources and we appreciate um, your commitment to the schools. We also actively pursue grants um, wherever we, we can. And we have revolving funds, um, the single largest of which is our lunch fund, which we do receive federal reimbursement for the lunches that, the breakfast and lunches that we produce. So if you flip over, um, just to try to uh, get a snapshot of how we utilize the resources we have for school 20, you'll see a pie, shot, pie chart that shows the revenue breakdown for the year that we're currently in. In red is the chapter 70 money, which you can see is the single largest <coughs> revenue source that we have. Um, the city contributes about 25%. Um, and then we have grant funding and funding. One second. Um, we received this uh, as a chart, yes. right? Mm -hmm. My question is, um, for those who are listening at home, um, if we could have this shown um, on the uh, feed, um, if you can bring that up or not at this time. Um, I would have to. Ask. Okay, we'll do that in the future. There is an ability to have the slideshow also shown um, on our screens so that as you're talking, everyone can see what you're reflecting and we go by. But that's for the next time. Okay. Um, I'm happy to go back if, if anything gets missed. The uh, second pie chart you'll see is the expenditure breakdown for the current year. Schools are inherently a people-oriented business, so it's no surprise that the majority of our funding is for staffing and for benefits, uh, approximately 75%, just under 75%. Then um, our special education non-labor, our tuitions, our contract services, transportation facilities, IT, and supplies, et cetera, just to give you an idea of how those resources are used. Moving on to enrollment, um, it's been um, you know, quite an interesting many decade where um, starting in the early 2000s, the school district were only about 5,600, 5,700 students. There was a tremendous, tremendously rapid growth until about 2013, where we ended up at over um, 6,400, 60, um, and we've been staying in that over 6,000 range. Um, each year we do projections for enrollment. And right now, and it's a three-year rolling average, we're projecting about level enrollment. Um, the number of students directly ties into our revenues since we're paid on a per pupil. So that's why we pay super close attention to the enrollment trend. So moving into fiscal 21, as the superintendent said, we are projecting no increase in chapter 70. I'm oh, sorry, can we get the number of enrollment? 62, the current number is... 62.57 and is on average so of the for the last four years since 2014 has been around 6200 62.50 um we are projecting also no increase in the charter school reimbursement the state does offer a modest amount of revenue to offset the cost in charter schools um, in this environment of no revenue increases, costs do go up. We are projecting increased costs in charter school expenses based on the enrollment, a small increase in charter school students. So we build that into our assumptions. If you look at the table that says projected revenues, you can see the detail there. Um, so chapter 70 and the city funding is used for any Chelsea child, regardless of where they're going to school. So from the total amount, uh, projected for fiscal 21, just over 100 million. We back out, we add to that the revenue coming in for charter schools, and then we deduct from that the expenses for charter schools, which right now we're projecting over 15 million, 15.1 million dollars for charter school expenses. The city also contributes funding for items that are not net school spending eligible. This includes our yellow buses our um, intergenerational literacy program. So, um, and then funding above the minimum, which the city does contribute. So all of that all together um, means that we have a net reduction 
of approximately 182,000. So even though we're calling it a level budget, there is actually a modest reduction. So how are we proposing to use those funds? I thought I would, um, if you go to the next table. So everything uh, costs more, more to stay put. It actually costs more each year as the cost of inflation, et cetera. So the expenditure forecast ongoing operations shows that we are projecting our expenses with no change to um, go up approximately $2 million. This includes the cost of labor, insurance, retirement, our special education tuitions traditionally increase year over year, uh, transportation. There are a few positions that were on grants that were ending and the programs are so valuable, we would like to move them over onto the general fund. Um, the social communication class, that is our programming for autism. By state law, there are maximums of number of students per class. So we realized we need to add a class at the first grade level in the early learning center, actually pre-K level, pre-K level. And um, one uh, position that would be full-time, but it's dramatically offset by Harvard University providing us with the labor with the cost of the position. So that coupled with the charter school reduction is about a $2.2 million cut that we have to, to make to stay in place where we are right now. So proposed plan, um, even though we're in this difficult situation, this district is not moving away from its commitments to some um, important programs. So we will still be expanding the Caminos program. This year at the, um, we're expanding it both in terms of numbers of grades and also the width of the numbers of classes. So as we had planned, we're moving forward with the expansion at the first grade. So we'll be going from two first grade Caminos classes to four. There'll be no net increase because we're using existing positions for that change. We're also moving up into the seventh grade for the first time, and there's no cost increase for that because we're using existing positions to facilitate that. But it does show the commitment to this really valuable program. Um, and in the table, you'll see a few of the changes for the social communication, and then a number of grant funded positions that um, we're proposing to do. Uh, and then on the general fund side, we do need to put more money into translation for our um, special education program. Um, we are required by law to offer translation services to our family. Um, the reductions are on the next page. The um, goal with this budget is to not reduce positions um, wherever we can. So you'll see a number of cuts to operational or other lines. So salary contingency line is just that is a contingency. Um, some one-time expenses in tuition we're reducing. Um, we're proposing not to increase our SPED tuition line, even though normally we would do that. Uh, we do have authority from the school committee to prepay a portion of the 21 tuition using 2020 dollars. It's allowed by law, and it's going to help reduce some of the burden on the 21 budget by using dollars that we have available today. Reducing extraordinary maintenance, reducing electricity. We're in a long-term contract and we've changed all our lights to LED, so we're seeing some savings there. Uh, don't increase transportation. Um, transfer some monies to one-time funding. Discontinue succession planning. We are reducing one position in the superintendent's office and moving where we can bits of positions onto revenue streams that we have and reducing one duplicate position. So that is our spending cut plan, and um, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Can you explain how, in that proposed reduction, uh, the idea of uh, explain move portion of three early learning child positions to revenue? What does that mean when you? So our parents do pay for extended day. Um, it's a it's a revolving account that the city has. We are fortunate that we've been managing the money very carefully, so we can put portions of positions on that right now without depleting the funding. So um, we'll be using a little bit of the reserve, but we'll still have um, reserve in that account, so we won't go negative. So the extended day is a, is paid by the parents? I think they pay $5 a day. 
to have their child into the extended day program. Okay. And so that becomes not something that is paid for by the school department or the city, but now turned over and the, the cost is shifted over to the parents. Is that what is happening here? It's a, it's a modest proportion of the cost of the program, but it is an, ex, an additional service that we offer to families should they want to, actually, should they get into the lottery for the extended day. They do contribute part of the cost. And so what what is it uh, a possible cost that they will be looking at now versus before, potentially? If, if a child, were, you know, if the child could continue to participate in the longer day, what cost is that? Is, uh, is that just five dollars a day, five dollars extra per day? For for them, yes. And in exchange, we have the teacher, we have the supplies, the activities. Mm -hmm. I believe they get a snack at that point or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the special assistance, uh, what what position was that? You can uh, that that is now no longer existing. No. Uh, we had a couple of new principals this year, and I'm sorry, you had a what? A couple of new principals this year that needed some coaching, so we hired a fantastic principal from the Boston Public Schools to come in and coach and mentor, and so she was doing that. But in light of the cuts, we decided that she could take on some other roles. Let's continue to do that. So we've um, basically cut that position. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Uh, oh, so you were able to do it. Yes. Yeah, so go down to the proposed reductions. It's like one of the last yep. slides. So uh, it's page 12. You're on eight. That's so those are revenues. That's uh, to those at home that are looking at this, I was asking questions relative to that. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I was asking a couple of those line items about any questions. So um, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna ask my colleague, uh, Councilor Robinson, if you have any questions, and then we'll go to those who are at home and I'll uh, view them. So uh, actually just to speak on behalf of the early learning center, which one? granddaughter was a participant um, from September and so she left in January and paid the five dollars, which I think it was a lot of money to ask for parents to pay per day instead of another hours that the kids would benefit more. Um, so I'm going to make that observation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Taylor, do you have any questions that you would like to have for the school committee? I mean, sorry, the superintendent in regards to the school committee budget that was approved. I'm, I'm just curious, what is the what is the COLA percentage? COLA? Yeah. What is the COLA percentage? Cost of living adjustment? It depends on the different bargaining agreements. So we did pick up based on what's in the effective agreements that are in place today. We, but we don't know what... We don't know what that is. We can get that for you. Okay, I'm looking at the screen. Is there any counselors that have a question? Yes, counselor. Yes, counselor. I'm going to recognize counselor Damali Vidal. I see her on the screen. I'll get to you after. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. Um, thank you, Monica and um, Superintendent Albeda for this. I do have a couple of questions and a, and a comment. Um, student resource officers that are in the schools, who pays for that? We have an agreement with the city police of the, and right now it is, we pay for the majority. Um, the school system is paying for the majority of the SROs. Okay. okay. And what is it that we're currently uh, paying for that? Um, the exact dollar amount, Councilor Damali, I'd have to look into that for you. Okay. 
And then the other question I have is with respect to the Student Opportunity Act. Um, yes. I know that we're supposed to be re that we're supposed to be getting funding over the course of the next seven years. I know it's broken up into four different yes. parts. And I know that when the governor initially proposed his budget that the th three out of the four pots were fine except for the low income. Are you saying now that we don't know where it stands with all of it? Yes, we have been told to submit a plan by June 19th by the commissioner. Um, and so the school committee on May 12th approved a proposed plan for three years. And so we are submitting that on the 19th. But again, there's no guarantees. We do not know if we're receiving the funding or not. On all of it? All of it. Wow. Okay. Um, if you can get me the information on the SROs, and then lastly, the comment I just want to uh, say is that I'm really excited about the work that you all are doing with respect to expanding the Caminos program. It is an amazing program, one of the best in the schools. And so I'm really glad that in light of all the cuts and reductions that, that, that we're expanding there, because I think it really provides some great opportunity for our students. So I just wanted to thank you all for that. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Can I just add something? Uh, um, Council of Rideau, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Uh, most cities and towns, most uh, chief executives are operating under the assumption that there's going to be zero student opportunity at all coming to cities and towns this year. That's, the, that's yeah. sort of the message that we have been getting. And what we're fighting now is to try to protect from further cuts of the FY20 Chapter 70 money. But oh, we're sorry. all, we, when I say we, I'm telling you chief executives, mayors, and all these surrounding communities are operating on the assumption that there's going to be no Student Opportunity Act money. And what we're trying to prevent is a further cut from level funded FY20. So, and I can expand on that. So, Councilor Jamali, we've been we've been working on um, scenarios, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, imagine coming into this budget on um, March 12th when we were supposed to have our budget hearing with 11 million dollars extra, and then we end up leveling our our budget, which was 2 million. 2.2 million. So really it's 13 million less that we had to create a budget with. Uh, we've been told to expect, um, let's see, the words are level funding would be a good day. And <laughs> anything above that is extra, but we're not, I'm not expecting SOA. And wow. we're, we're, we're completing the application right now. We passed the plan, but we're it we we'll have it for the future, and we gained all kinds of community information. So that was for not. We know what the community values as a result of the outreach and the surveys. So I keep telling my team all our efforts were not in vain because we gathered an an incredible amount of information to help guide us in our strategic planning. I just want to add one more thing. The budget that Ami submitted to me and that I submitted to you assumes this level funded FY same money on Chapter 70 that we're getting in FY20, we're going to get in FY21. If there is a cut to that number, school department and I will have to go back to the drawing board. So is it is it because of the pandemic? Is that what the excuse is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Wow. And today was the day that if we were going to lay off anyone, we would have had to notify um, staff today, and we did not. So we're, we, we are hopeful that we'll at least get level funding, and we're just going to work from there. We don't know what our numbers are going to be, so we do need some advocacy. Wow. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that was one of my questions, uh, Monica, Madam Superintendent. Um, did you lay off anyone during this um, academic COVID-19 era? 
we did not lay off anyone. As a matter of fact, we employ, we kept all our employees. We paid our contract employees. We paid everyone that was on our roster, including some of our after school programs. We did everything we could to uh, to ensure that people were taken care of. Okay, um, how many um, tablets did you pass out to students during the COVID-19 um, era and where was it that was funding from? 3,500. And where was that um, funding? Where, where would we see the, the amount of that funding? Where was that funding? Because I couldn't um, figure out where it was from. I can tell you that our predecessor, um, uh, Dr. Mary Burke was wise and she had, they had over the years pro, per, uh, purchased enough Chromebooks for our students. Okay. And so we had ample supply of Chromebooks for students. Um, it came out of, I don't, I'm assuming it came out of chapter 70 prior to me being here. Yeah, we have enough for every classroom now and we're in a process of replenishing typically a quarter each year so that it's not a, a huge burden on an annual basis. So each year we're, we're replenishing a quarter of that. Um, literally this year, because of the pandemic and because so many are out with the students, we are buying an extra large order, but it's been work that's been done over a number of years to give us the inventory that we have. We were very fortunate to have the inventory that we had. We were one of, uh, and, and I give all credit to Dr. Mary Burke for taking care of us. Okay, so so I guess that's the answer to my question. None of that funding reflect this budget that you're proposing, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Any other counselors? I got a question. Councilor Robinson, how, how many students presently are at the charter school that live in Chelsea? I what effect does that have on this budget? Um, I will give you that number. But um, each student that goes to a charter school goes with their dollars. Mm -hmm. So the amount that the state would have funded us, they, those dollars are then moved over into the charter schools. So um, it's why we want to keep as many kids in our schools to get the access to our teachers and also help support the district financially. So if that, if that amount is anywhere from 10000 to 15000 Per, per pupil, right. And you saw the $15 million swing yes. for the charter tuition. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one more question, please? Council DeVito. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, and, and I know that a lot of this falls back on the schools and the way that you've been feeding students during the pandemic, but it's just that you guys are at the front lines. I'm curious if there's any plan of providing any mental health issues or an increase in funding to support our our, our students uh, throughout this entire pandemic or when they come back to school? Sure. Um, I can tell you what we have right now, Cancer uh, Vito, we have 17 um, social workers. Uh, we are very well equipped and staffed. The plan with the Student Opportunity Act was to actually add more. Um, we had, I believe it was four more social workers that we were adding, um, but we're very well equipped. Uh, one thing I spoke today uh, with our leaders about was we need to take some time out when our kids return. And I, I call it a pause. And so when our students return in the fall, we're going to go slow to go fast. And so we have to acknowledge that there's been some um, trauma, if you will, or there's people have gone through so much with COVID, with the race issue, everything that's been happening. And so we need to stop and pause. We have to stop and pause for our staff. We have to stop and pause for our students. And so we're talking about having circle times, just times for people to really grieve and time to, to talk about what they've gone through. And then we'll move forward with some rigorous teaching and learning. And so those are the conversations that we're having right now. I have put together a task force and the task force has four quadrants for reopening. And one of those quadrants is health and wellness. And so I have a group of people who are working on health and wellness and how we're gonna address that when our students come back. We are, I have a hiring freeze right now, but I did not I do not have a hiring freeze on social workers, our nurses, our custodians, 
those are going to be absolutely critical to our mission when we come back. So right. um, at this point, we are continuing to hire nurses and social workers. And can you tell me those 17 social workers, the breakdown of it according to the schools and the grades? Um, I can get that for you. It's Please. I know they're uh, mostly at, there's a good five at the high school. And I, I can get, I can break that down. I'll you shoot you an it. email with all this other stuff okay. that I'm asking. Thank sure. you, Dr. Albeda. Sure. Any other counselors? Counselor Taylor? I'm, I'm on the projected revenue. You too, Roy. <laughs> um, what is, the, what is the indirect cost recovery? So for some of our federal grants, we are allowed to charge a um, small percentage on the salary. It's called indirect cost recovery. It's sort of the administrative cost of administering the grant, and those dollars flow initially to the city, and then the city in turn puts it as part of our revenue stream. By the way, we know how hard this must be uh, to review such a huge, uh, you know, this is not easy putting together these things and, uh, and uh, you can just imagine, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a big operation and, uh, you know, I, uh, it's the way it goes, but I, I really appreciate you guys. So thank you for, thank you for all the work that you had to redo. Uh, because of this, uh, you know, horrible pandemic that we find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Councilor Brown. Thank you, um, Madam Superintendent. I suggest a question. Um, what is the official graduation for the class of 2020, and how can we personally, if we if we wish to support them or? even recognize them with maybe an ad in the paper or something. I just want to know when is the date so okay. we can have that figure. So each of you have been invited to um, make a video for our um, graduating class of 2020. You should have received an invite probably in the I last week. Um, I will, we can, I can have somebody resend it. So we would okay. love, we've asked our school committee and our uh, city council to each send in a video that we can, we're going to put on cable. So please do that. Um, the official graduation is that when we first decided, uh, we made the decision that it would be a virtual graduation, which is going to be July 12th. And so that will be virtual and then we'll, It'll be online and then we'll have it posted online for a while. Um, we're also, as a result of a later decision, we're gonna do a walk-in graduation where students can physically walk in, get their diplomas in their caps and gowns in August. And that'll be the first week of August over, it's gonna take a couple of days because they have to do it individually. So it'll be August uh, 4th, I believe, uh, August 4th through the, I'm not sure how many days it's going to be, but maybe two or three days. Okay. So, so and we can send you information. Yeah, please, uh, because, I, again, I've been having problems receiving emails um, from the city site. Um, I was in the office today. I think they got fixed. But I, so many people were asking me about drive-bys and helping to recognize the student. I just didn't know their official date. I, I think it's going to be the 12th then for the virtual, correct? July will be the virtual. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, Councilor Recupero. Um, I see here your budget increased for 4.4 million dollars from last year. It says here general fund increase from 2019 4.4 million. Okay. In August of 2019, the state did come back after the state budget was approved, and we did have an increase. But this is the difference between 
2019 to 2020. So we try to always make sure that you're aware as the revenues change from year to year. So that slide shows that we got $4 million between 2019 and 2020, part of which came in over the summer with the increase in Chapter 70 from the state. So do you expect another increase for the 21? We are expecting zero increase for 21. Our budget is level funded, and which is why we're in a cut position. We're having to cut $2.2 million out of the budget to stay so, level. So you cut the $2.2 million, and you're going to add more teachers from that money or take away teachers? We didn't cut any teachers. You we... said you cut $2.2 million from the budget, right? Yes, correct. So from that $2.2 million, you cut it from where? Are you going to add so if you look at the last page, it'll show you a table of the reductions. And none of those reductions are for a teacher, except for a fourth grade where the enrollment from the third grade rising up doesn't warrant the fourth grade position. So let very last page table. I'm sorry, I can't understand you too well. Because I'm partly deaf, you know, I don't hear too well to start with, so. Uh, the the reductions are on class. So no teacher reduction. The only staff reduction is in the superintendent's office. One position in the superintendent's office. One yes. from the superintendent's office? Yes. And how much is that taken out? Um, reduction, what is it? Minus three hundred thousand was on the cost. One fourteen. Uh, it was one hundred and fourteen. One hundred and fourteen thousand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. So you don't intend to add more teachers? No. Why? The school system needs more teachers. What is the size of classes on your school? What are the amount of students that you have in each class? Councilor Cooper, earlier before you came in, uh, it was explained. Uh, Ten minutes expired already. No, I was saying earlier, well, before you came in, oh. the superintendent and the budget director, Lamboy. I'm sorry, I wasn't here, so I'm asking the question because I don't know. Explained that they, the eleven million dollars that was supposed to come from the state. Uh, is not coming. Yeah, I know. I just seen that the 62 is dropped. And uh, as a basis of that, they are already starting with a $2.5 million deficit. And despite them being down basically $13 million, that they're uh, at a position where they did not fire anyone. I understand that. But I'm saying, uh, I hear from people, right? This is my own thing. I know we're in it. We will lose it and we don't have money for this and that, right? But overall, I hear that the class sizes are too big. They said, what is the average class size? I heard it's like 30 kids to a class or more. Um, is that the truth or not? No, the average class size ranges from 25. It depends, like at the high school, some classes might be at 30, but then the next class would be at 20. So it just so you're saying the average class size is 20 students to each class that you have. You never go the maximum you go to 25? No. Good. I mean, some classes may have up to 30, but it's at the high school mostly. It could be uh, one well, period. That's the high school, right? Yeah. Not the middle class. You know the middle school? Yeah. What is your average? But some of these This is what I mean. If the class size is larger than close to 40 people, there, it, the average class size is 25. That's the average class size. So if we come one day, just out of the blue, and go and inspect your class, there'll be 25 students at the maximum, right? So the parents that are telling me this, they're telling me a lot. And the majority of our classrooms, you'll see probably less than 25. You will see 25. Okay. I think you'll work for the parents are telling me there's more than 20 kids to a class. You know, that's 20, that they're telling me the average is between 25 to 35. That's what they're telling me. So I don't know if they are back to I'm asking you. Yeah. So I'm thinking you'll do it for it. Yeah, if that's what it is. The average ends up being about 25. Okay. So one last question, and then I'm going to ask one more question. In the near future, I know you can't do it now, but 
But in the near future, are you intend to get more teachers and get the practice size smaller? Or are we going to hire more teachers for more education yeah. for the kids? Um. We would love to do that in the near future, and that was the plan before with the Student Opportunity Act money that we were supposed to receive. We were looking at increasing um, teachers for special education, English language learners. We were looking at increasing paraprofessionals to, to lower class size. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have 25 physical bodies in the classroom, but we still will have three adults instead of two adults because we obviously are, have a space, space issues as well. So we can lower class size, but that's with adults being in the classroom. And that was the plan with the Student Opportunity Act. Unfortunately, we are not probably not going to be receiving the Student Opportunity Act this year. But in the future, you will go and try to yes. make a plan? Yes, that was part of, part of our, our plan with the Student Opportunity Act. And we lost $12 million. We're losing a good Thanks. amount. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What's next? Glory, Glory. Yes, sir. Do we have a page for the regional school on the twenty one proposal? Yes. The, um, the, first of all, my name is Ed Dunn. I'm the city auditor for the city of Chelsea, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here to help to present the budget to the community for this evening. Regional schools, you have three documents that we will be referring to this evening. The first document would have been labeled City Manager Proposed Budget for Fiscal 21. And that is a 58-page document. You will find regional schools on page 31 of that document. The second item that we presented this evening is called the Annotated City Manager's Budget. And you'll refer to page 13 of that document for additional detail. So... Are we ready to go? No, no Okay, so the regional schools budget, we are proposing a level funded budget of a million five thirty nine seven fifty five, the same as last year's. We have a bulk of this money that pertains to the Northeast Regional Vocational School, and we have two smaller schools as well. So we have about 250 students that uh, are proposed to be at Northeast Regional Vocational. We have one student at Medford Tech. We have one student at Essex Agricultural and one student on the waiting list at Essex Agricultural. We are concerned with the number of enrollees for Northeast Vocational. The information that we have came before the pandemic, so we're not certain at this point, whether or not the enrollment will go up or will go down. So we're recommending that we level fund this budget at this time for the possibility that it may increase from the enrollment that they had told us. We have 272 students enrolled this year. They proposed back in mid-March, 250. So we're uncomfortable with presenting a lower budget than what we currently have in case those numbers go up. Councilor Robinson, any questions? Yeah, I actually do have one question that relates to the budget. And my, my concerns, I know that the vocational school was looking at the possibility of building a new school. Yes. And what kind of effect will that have 
on this budget or the new budget that will be going forward over the next year? I'm not certain of the future budgets, but this budget has no effect mm -hmm. at this time. I'm not certain if their plan has been revised. Uh, we'll have to get back in touch with their finance people at some point, or there, there may be a regional meeting of the 12 or so schools. Yeah, I think I mentioned this at last budget hearing uh, last year. The Northeast Regional School District is looking to build a brand new, very expensive high school. All the communities are going to be required to pay for it. They're, the way the statute is written, it is it's it's almost it, it is written in such a way that there is no chance that the communities will be able to prevent that new high school from being built and we will all be imposed a huge charge for that new high school and it will require us to go out to bond but this, it's just uncertain at this time what year that will hit our bonding capacity uh, they're in the very preliminary stages with the Mass School Building Authority on that project. They're in the feasibility study stage. So they're a few years away from starting construction, but ultimately this city and all cities in this district will be stuck paying a huge bill for that new high school that they're insisting on building. My, my, well, my, my concern is as to what that number is going to look like. I know that the school building fund has kind of cut back after the fiasco that they had in Newton um, in building their schools and took in a crazy amount of money and whether not, not, not if the vocational school is heading somewhere in that direction to get the math or whatever they can get from the school fund. I don't know what the breakdown is. I will just tell you that Chelsea will be on the hook for, multi, for a bond of multiple million dollars for the payment of that school bill. That's one question. Any other questions from counselors? This is on the outside Northeast School and the Essex Agricultural. Essex Agricultural. And, that's something uh, that's new. Uh, no, they've, they've had enrollment there for a couple of years now. Uh, there's two students that were there this past year, and the year before that, there was one this coming semester, uh, upcoming year, there would be one on the wait list and one actually enrolled. So there could be two. There is one definite, and there could be two. Okay. Medford's the new one. Medford Tech has only been on this list for two years. Okay. And the reason being is that the kids will go to those schools. So things are not being offered there. Correct. Yes. The only reason they are allowed to go to a different folk school is if Northeast does not offer the program right. you're looking for, then we are required to pay for them to go to another vocation um, Any questions regarding the regional schools? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the next. And the no. next is the uh, treasurer's office. office. So we'll just give a minute to bring in the department head in. In the meantime, if you'll turn to page nine on your main document, proposal document. Page nine is the treasurer's office. The annotated version is page four. And on the annotated version, it refers you to a salary chart. So you would have also received from the city manager earlier today a salary listing of employees by department. And that lists every employee and their salary for fiscal 21. Page six of that document will be what you see for the treasurer's office. So if I'm looking, this is the one that's the employee, which one, where, what, yep. what page? Page what six. Page six. Page six. The numbers are small on that, but it's six page in treasurer's office. We have with us this evening Patrice Montepasco. She's the city treasurer. Patrice Montepasco. So we have a salary line of 444.14 that consists of seven staff members who are assigned to the treasurer's office. The increase is step-related. 
We do not have any increases for salary for fiscal 21, other than step increases that have been applied. Longevity is at 3,300, a slight increase. Unused sick leave bonus is down 900. This is a benefit that is received by contractually by the, by the unions, the CBA agreements that state that if you have perfect attendance, you get a benefit of X number of dollars. And this is based on performance. And the reason the number would go down is if someone hadn't earned it in the previous quarter or the previous year, we see no need to budget it going forward. Uh, another reason that it might go down is if there is a new person that's added to the force that has not yet proven perfect attendance. So that would be the reason for the reduction here. You go into the operations lines, you'll notice that the professional and technical line is down 10,000. The primary reason for that is we have a risk assessment plan that we have modified the scope on for fiscal 21. So that will result in a savings of $10,000. We don't think that we'd be able to accomplish as much as we set out to accomplish based on the pandemic and some other reasons that would slow that project down. So we may look at increasing that in fiscal 22. We have banking services down 5,500. Patrice can get into more detail on that. The overall budget is 657,864, which is a 3% increase from the prior year, roughly $19,000. So that's the treasurer's budget. Any questions? Council is here. Any questions? Those are in the room. No. Yeah, are there any questions from anyone um, calling in? Anyone raising a hand? You know what? I'll kid you and I, if we sit back and run it, be okay. But you know what? Some of those young kids wasn't there. My son, he's 30 years old. He was there at the march. He, his sign stated that, you know, being black, being. Oh, that's not him. That's not okay. That was Calvin. No, that was Calvin talking about something else. So, um, any anyone else raise their hand if they want to speak on to the treasurer's office? No, seeing none. Okay. I got one. Uh, Councilor Robinson, we can talk about the decrease in the banking services. Sure. Um, what happened was um, we we always went out for banking services and we had our lockbox fee. Mm -hmm. And I, we, we went to a bank that didn't charge us any fees whatsoever. So we reduced that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one other department, or one other division in mm -hmm. Treasury that uh, is assigned to Patrice, and that's the liability insurance on page 55 of your proposed budget sheet. This is also level funded. There is a $750,000 insurance liability expense and a $5,000 deductible. This is page 55. There is no change to this from the previous year. <clears throat> this is the line that we pay all of our vehicle insurance, property insurance mm -hmm. uh, for all of our city owned vehicles and buildings. You have any questions on that? Yes. Council Taylor. So do you expect to see uh, recouping, recouping some of this money and premiums next year because City Hall is closed, um, people working from home, any kind of benefit that we're going to get from this as, say, you know, other companies out there? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I think our treasurer would probably have to talk with our insurance rep to make a determination on whether that's uh, something that they're offering. Uh, with with the personal um, use of personal vehicles, I know some insurance companies were giving credits back, but in, in our case, we have emergency vehicles that are running regardless of, of the shutdowns. Uh, so I'm, I'm not certain of that. That's something I think that we'd have to investigate further with our insurance rep. We certainly haven't heard anything from our carriers that they're doing that. You, you might want to 
just check with them because they may not be contacting you about that. But uh, you know, some some of the so I know some of the insurance companies. I'm not sure how it works with uh, with gov with the local governments as opposed to the businesses. Okay. Well, because we still run in fire vehicles, police vehicles, PPW vehicles. Uh, so you can ask, but I doubt it. Right. We'll we'll get that information, and I'm not sure if we'll have it tomorrow night, but if we can have it later in the week, we'll happily we'll share that. Any questions? Seeing none. All right, we'll move on to purchasing. Purchasing. So we'll just give a minute for the department head. Thank you for training. Thank you. So on purchasing, if you'll turn to page six of the budget document. And page two of the annotator. Sorry, what page? Page six of the budget document and page two of the annotated version. And then on the salary document, you'll want to look at page four. Page four of the salary document. So again, it's page six for the proposed budget document, page two of the annotated document, and page four of the salary listing. Okay. So we have uh, Dylan Cook, who is the chief procurement officer. And Roger Ivanis, who is the assistant procurement officer for the city of Chelsea. We're looking at page six of our proposed sheet, page four of the salary listing. The 140,204 is a salary for two individuals. This department is undergoing some transition, which we can talk about in a little bit, but there was a drop in salary for $33,000 as a result of that restructuring. The 2,400 unused sick leave and the 900 longevity are new items that are coming into this budget from DPW. So with Drajic or Ivanis now scheduled to work in this department more regularly, her benefits are also transferring into this department from the DPW budget. So you'll see that later on in the week when we talk about DPW. In the operations listings, there's very minimal change, $100 increase in the rent copier lease and a $100 decrease in the equipment maintenance, which Dylan can talk about if you'd like additional information. So this is a very small budget. We're down about 12% overall, $30,000 decrease. So if I could just, uh, for the council, as you probably saw in my letter today, uh, Dylan is leaving us as of July 1 to go work in the school department. We are promoting Muga to the position of chief procurement yeah. officer, and uh, that will all take effect on July 1. So the budget reflects that uh, there will only be two people in that office. Uh, this is one of the places where we're trying to save money uh, for in FY21. It's probably an office that does need another half-time person, but we will, in, in this place and in some other places, as we'll see in FY21, we're trying to sort of muddle through this one bad fiscal year. And so we'll do that here in procurement, but uh, Uber will be taken over for Dylan and, and it will be Uber and Marjana will be the only employees in that office in fiscal year 21. So and we and Bula is the new employee you're hiring or no? No, she's a she's the business manager in DPW who in fiscal 20 was half time in DPW as the business manager and half time in procurement as, as the assistant. Now she's promoted to chief procurement okay. officer. Going so there'll be she will run this and she will be the department head and she'll have my so it's a two, it will be a two-person office coming away. Okay. Um, any questions? Any questions from uh, counselors at home? No, thanks. Everything sounds good. 
Okay. Moving on. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. City oh, clerk. Thank you. Uh, next up is the city clerk's office. City clerk uh, is on page 17 of the main budget document, page seven of the annotated version. We have two divisions in the clerk's office, the city clerk's department and then parking. So it's page 17 of the budget document, page seven of the annotated document. And then um, give me a minute to find the salary page. 17 of the budget document. Yeah. 17 of the budget document, seven of the annotated budget document, and page 11 of the salary document. We have Jeanette Centron White here, who is the city clerk. She represents the city clerk's department and parking. The salary listing is up about $13,000. There are no increases in fiscal 21 for this department other than step increases. So when there is a step increase that's contractual, and this is over time, there is a pay chart that people progress through with two unions, the SEIU union and the Steelworkers union. And as they continue through that chart, they receive a step increase. So this $13,000 increase is attributed to that. In the, so, go ahead. I just want to clarify something. Okay. In the operations section, you'll see a variety of changes. There are small decreases where we could make those decreases. Some printing costs, the rent and lease of the buildings, data processing services, different things where we could have a savings um, from what we had spent in fiscal 20. Jeanette did a pretty good job of looking at some of her expenses and being able to reduce some of it is related to polls that uh, we don't have as many elections on. And uh, most of it is just minor things that she had not spent in the previous year and we were able to reduce. So overall, this budget is down $44,000, 10.8%. I just want to make a general comment on all of these salary numbers where you see the variance between FY20 and FY21. We're comparing the proposed FY21 budget to what was adopted in FY20. When we adopted the FY20 budget, it did not include the raises which have been approved in the interim for FY20. So we're comparing FY21 to FY19 salary. So the, that 13,000 is not someone's step increase. The step increase aren't that much, but you're also reflecting the fact that the adopted budget for FY20 did not include the FY20 salary. So the actual increase people are getting between 20 and 21 for everyone is 0% unless you're getting a step increase because you're on an anniversary date and you're still on a step. Okay. Um, so that's the clerk's budget. Do we have questions? Any questions on the clerk? Todd, any? No. Not right now. No, no, we had one salary. We had we did have a salary increase of uh six percent. Um, it says 13,000 regular salary city clerks, 13,331. Um, but I'm trying to, I'm looking at the city clerk here, yeah, and the city clerk only shows a $3,900 step. So I'm curious of the discrepancy between what I'm seeing here and the budget 161. Over here, I'm seeing 3,900 on longevity, but I don't see how the increase happened from 13,000. Well, so, what are those again? Yeah. Understand. Understand that. So that $13,000 increase that you're seeing is comparing the total salaries for FY21 to what you adopted in 20. 
but it doesn't include the raise that it did in 20 that you approved in the last six months for everyone in this office, whether they were steel workers or SEIU. And so that's where that, that's the differential you're seeing. The other thing to keep in mind in all of these salary numbers that you're going to see is that some of the increase is due to the fact that we are paying 53 weeks of salary in fiscal year 21. So everyone's salary that you're seeing, those aren't their annual salaries. That's a little more than everyone's annual salary because that's a 53 week salary in that salary worksheet you're seeing. And in all in 20 and most years, you're comparing that to a 52 week salary. So what I'm saying is in all of these regular salary lines, when you are seeing the increase, you just have to keep in mind two things. One, it's not reflective of the, of the raise that was granted in 20, because people are still getting, you just approved some of that. You haven't even given people their retroactive pay for 20 months. So it's not reflected in the 20 number. And second is that the 21 budget is a, 53 week budget, so it has an inflated salary. So that accounts for the difference between the 13,000 you're seeing and the step raises that you're seeing of $3,900. So step raises are only accounting for a small piece of this 13,000. The balance is one of those two factors that it's 53 weeks and that it's not reflecting the raise. So when we, on a annual basis, every once in a while, city council is asked to, um, if you can answer this question, asked to approve a raise that the city has negotiated, i.e. you, you negotiate with a union and you put in a raise and the, and the, the raise amount seems to us to say, either 2.5% or 2%, but cumulatively it just shows up as uh, 6%. So uh, it just, it's, in, it's, I'm trying to wrap, have my mind wrap around the fact that how we go from a raise that potentially is 2.5%, but then cumulatively in the budget, it's almost 6 So that 6% is a reflection of let's say three things one that a portion of that is because the fy21 number is reflecting 53 weeks not 52. Mm -hmm. second factor it's reflecting the 2.75 percent raise that people got in 20 that isn't reflected in the 20 number you're seeing there and third it would include any step raises so the combination of those three things amount to a 6.34% increase. But the only negotiated increase was the 2.75 increase for FY12. So if there was an added column here of 2020 actual budget, the 2020 actual budget probably would have a number higher than the 210. Yes, because that's not reflecting the raise that you've already approved. So the jump from actual budget to proposed budget would be a lot smaller. Smaller. Yes. And but, but again, keep in mind that extra every there's an extra week's pay built into the 21 budget that isn't in the 20 budget. Okay. And won't be reflected next year either. Most, you know, six out of seven years, we are at a 50 Okay. Any other Questions. Any questions from the counselors uh, at home? No? All set. All right. Okay, so the second division in Jeanette's department is the parking division. That is page 30 of the main budget document, page 13 of the annotated document. Page 21 of the salary list. 
what page on this one? Uh, 21. I have one of those. Page 21. Um, those were emailed. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. Councilor uh, Cooper, we're on live, so please. I can make copies of everything. Huh? I can make copies of everything. But I don't have one right now. You can really use mine. I know. So I said, uh, sorry, so it's 30, uh, 21, and what was this last? 30, uh, 13, and 21. So thir 13 is the annotated version. Page 30 is the main document. Page 21 is the salary document. Yes. Okay. So th this salary. This salary has two individuals uh, included and two individuals included in the parking department. The increase of $9,000, just over $9,000, is uh, the same as what we just talked about with, with uh, the city manager, being the several factors that have increased that to 9%. The unused sick leave bonus um, is an increase uh, from one year prior. Somebody had earned, as we had talked about in an earlier department, had earned a, a uh, perfect attendance award, then we would be, uh, we would be budgeting that at a higher number to accommodate that going forward. That's a contractual issue. And so that's why you'll see that it went up to 1500 from 300. In the operations sections, there are a couple of things. The postage increase of 33,000 is listed. Uh, Jeanette can get into that in a few minutes. There's a couple of drops here, a $2,000 drop in equipment maintenance, and a $2,400 drop in gasoline. Specifically on the gasoline, you're going to notice in, in departments later this week, fire, police, EPW, uh, this department, um, ISD, that we have a drop in the gasoline. Prices have gone down, so various uh, percentage of drop is reflected in this budget, in those budgets as well. So that's the um, end of the operations. So the $5,000 in parking meters. They're in the capital section. That's some maintenance of meters. We consider that a capital expense, and there is maintenance that is required or replacement of parts that are required on some of those machineries. Overall, this budget is just slightly up 4%. That's mostly because of the operations increase. So can I ask uh, where the uh, why the huge increase in uh, postage? So uh, that's with our contract. It's an obligation, um, but we're working to. So we're going into the second year. Um, we're going to look to manage that. It's just that they do things differently with the mailing of um, how they mail out their notices. So, for example, we have a lot of people that have a list of tickets, and so they send out more notices. So we're working with them to. We're going to manage that number. We're not trying to spend that much so we're working with them now and uh from remind me of the reasoning behind the the large increase between 2019 and 2020 in the data processing services of nearly one hundred thousand dollars what was that increase to uh, our online transactions go, go. so we have um so we have the mobile app which we implemented um the digital permit um platform so when you go online and um you get issued the permit, um, that service, and the data, just having the, like all that is there's a cost to that. So what is now, um, that we're probably two or three years into this process, what is the number of transactions per office that you are now doing more via online versus, you know, what, basically what is the number of tr online transactions that are occurring now, different from say two, three years ago. Um, Do you have a, a number of what the volume is? In, in no, I don't. But we didn't have even just two years ago. I got uh, dog licenses online. Um, mm -hmm. Our register is digital, so now it, because we have city hall systems, that's how we got the dog licenses. You can order your birth certificate, death, marriage online now. Mm -hmm. Those things just happen within the last few years. 
and then this digital platform for the online services, for the parking, and for the app. So these things are really just kind of just started. Um, even when we could pay by phone, it wasn't the percentage most people want to come into City Hall and make a payment at Treasury because mm -hmm. they want to pay with cash or they're here, they're walking distance. But um, and then especially with what's going on with COVID. A lot of people are going online and applying for their permits now because they're not trying to come into the building. So and you have to see that out too. Oh yeah. Online. Just this morning, I think we had we came in and uh, we get the email. I think we had a hundred this morning. Uh, my guess would be a hundred applications online. So it's it's people are it's catching on. Well, so I'm trying to understand what the change has been and the increase in percentage. So I'm, I'm sure it's changed more. So I'm just trying to understand a graph of how many more, how much more we're doing online versus in person compared to three years ago. If that's comparable, number, of, uh, you know, we can we can you can get the number of activity from say nine one one. They'll tell you the number of calls they receive on an annual basis. Police will tell you rate of crime by number of arrests per year. The fire department tells you how many responses they have. So my um, my curiosity is. What is the volume of transactions that the office handles in total? And then of that total, what is how many are online? What are what is online? Just uh, just a, it's it's a big data question. So I guess that's my question. I don't know why we put you get the total number of transactions online and not then and in calendar. It should be yeah. 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 It's the in-person transactions that may be uh, right. In-person is more cost. difficult, but I think you have all this information. Yeah. And then the idea is later on is the manager, what is he going to do with that information to try to manage the business of City Hall? So you're you're doing big data, so you figure out what where you're going with all this. So the only the only presentation I have is we have a new manager on that came on uh, June last February. So we could probably compare calendar year 19 to what's happened calendar year 20 to be what the transaction would be. Well, it's going to be skewed for COVID. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it, but, but, um, but but that skew but, may end up being permanent and saving money for because, because now they've got to do it, now they know how to do it, and it's a lot easier to come in there. Right. Once you said there are going to be some changes. Right. And some people the the angst of doing this online. Is now longer there. Once you put your information, you used to do it, you may avoid that. So I'm just curious. So we get that comparison. Yeah. Leo, any questions? No questions. Todd? No. Anyone uh, at home has any questions to the yes. parking committee? Um, excuse me. Yes, um, Jeanette, how are you doing? Thanks for being with us today. And can you just explain to me again about the proposed budget under the unsick? Um, leave bonus. I know um, I heard you say something, but um, 2020 was $300. Now it's a $1,200 increase. Who benefits? How, how does that work? There are there are two individuals in that department, Councillor, and they're they're contractually um, the, the contract. The, the CBA shows that there's a value to their sick bonus benefit. And if they mm -hmm. have a three, they have a three hundred dollar benefit for a six month time frame, and then another three hundred for the second six month time frame. And if they do the entire year um, without absences, it adds to nine hundred. So one individual is getting nine hundred, and the other individual is getting six. So that's different than last year, where one person qualified for only a part of the year at three hundred. This year, we're finding that both individuals would qualify for a full benefit based on their history. So it's okay. a little bit different. Like you don't usually see this big of a jump from one right. to the next on, on sick bonuses, but in this case, it just happens that these two individuals that are mm -hmm. that are staffing this department do qualify for perfect attendance uh, all the way through for the whole year. Okay. Um, also under the postage, and I know Councilor Evelyn Janeda spoke about this, from the 49186 to 75000 with the three, 
thousand dollar increase. Jeanette, are you, um, tell me about that. Is, is that just for parking tickets or meters? Does that have anything to do with the elections with it coming up? People um, potentially going to be getting mail-in ballots. Are you going to be paying for postages? Uh, no, so that's not out of this line. So this is just uh, the uh, contractual obligation because we're going yep. into the second year. Um, but we don't plan on trying to, to try to meet that number. It's just the way we're working with the vendor now on how we mail to people their late notices. So yes. your late notice, um, uh, any late notices being marked at the registry. Um, be a parking program, parking program mailings. Yeah, so whatever sticker we program. Can, like, yes, so the residential, any mailings there. Um, I'm trying to think. So, um, the, anything the from law box. So, is, let's yeah. say, for example, you send a partial payment. We don't take partial payments, so they send out a letter for us on our, on our behalf, things like that. Um, anyone who uh, is marked at the registry after a certain amount of years, if you mm -hmm. have tickets or too many tickets, um, many different plates, mm -hmm. all these, these are all mailings, just delinquent. Okay. Um, for the, the the last question, counselor, um, the, for the parking and meter, I'm sorry, for the parking and meter, um, there's five thousand dollars. How much did you use for 2019? Um, I haven't I haven't spent anything there. So you haven't spent anything there, and you're asking for an additional five thousand this year. Is that correct? Uh, well, I wouldn't call it additional. It's it's five thousand per year. So whatever isn't spent in fiscal twenty will go back as a surplus to the undesignated fund balance. So it's not that it's lost. If it isn't spent, it goes back as a as a credit. Um, but we do need. I, I I don't know that we can predict when a meter breaks and when you need to replace the parts. It's good to have the money there in order to accomplish that repair as needed. So these are because we have um, older digital meters, and so for the most part they work. But when people jam them up, like truly jam them up with gum or they put plastic into them, and we truly cannot repair them, uh, mm -hmm. we buy uh, more digital um, meters. The heads. That's what this is. The heads. So you know, we almost put a small amount of money for this purpose in the budget, so that we will have the flexibility to get some new meters during the course of the year. And if we don't spend it, it goes back to the general fund and services as free cash. Okay, so this what was unspent last year goes back to the general fund. It's not a surplus just sitting in your office, correct? No, no, it's general fund. Anything that's unspent on general fund, we can't carry over to the okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Anyone? President. Anyone else? Anyone at home? All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you, Jeanette. That's all. That's all. Thanks, that, will, uh, that concludes our uh, budget hearing for tonight. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I could do my budget as simple. We could just knock that off. We could do a little okay. budget and knock that off. Um, Councilors, we have nearly a half hour. And so if you'd like, we have, uh, we can do the city manager's uh, budget tonight and also our own city council budget. If you'd like to kind of speed things up. Yeah. Right. Direction, yeah, okay. So why don't we move forward? And we will do the uh, city manager's uh, position office. Okay, so that is on the main budget document, page three, on the annotated version, page one, and on the salary listing, page two. You want me to go through this? No. So, uh, again, the salary is the same. Most of that is basically, uh, since we didn't, uh, most of this is a reflection of the 53 weeks that were being paid in uh, fiscal year uh, 21, because uh, there were no salary increases beyond what was budgeted in fiscal year 20. So uh, 
uh, exempt employees did not get any increase. So in FY20, nor proposed in 21. So this is all, uh, this is almost all a reflection of 53 weeks of pay for FY21. The bottom, the operating, I've moved some money around mostly because the dues for the Metro Mayors Coalition, which is a really good coalition. This city's been a part of it since we started Metro Mayors back in 2003 uh, when I was in Revere. Uh, it's they increased the costs for the first time since the uh, organization started, but it was a $5,000 increase. So in FY21, that cost of joining at Metro Maze is going from 10,000 to 15,000. So I had to accommodate that uh, substantial increase. And so I did it by taking a little bit of money out of community events uh, and uh, a little bit of money out of conference and travel because I'm not planning to do any traveling uh, this year, even though my contract gives me 3,000 to do that. Uh, I don't anticipate doing much other than perhaps sending one of my uh, assistants to a conference, a local conference or something. Okay, councilors, any questions? Council, no? Anyone at home have any any questions? Um, I, no, no questions, but I was just trying to look at the numbers that um, the city manager was speaking of. Where is the 15,000 reflected at here? It's in the dues and subscriptions line item. So you see that increase from 18,000 to 25,000. I'm looking page on page three. two. I'm sorry, page, page, page three. Uh, page three. Page three. three. Yep. Yeah. So dues and subscriptions. Last year, I budgeted $18,000 okay. yes. for that. Yes. Now it's 25,000. But okay, I just can various subscriptions. Most of that is because of the five thousand dollar increase in the fee to be part of the Metro Mayor's Coach. Okay, and you said you moved um two thousand from your conference of three thousand a year before, right? Correct. And I took five thousand out of community events. That's kind of a catch-all line. Uh yeah. you know, so uh, okay. I just didn't see it. I wanted to see it. Thank you. We'll survive with 9,000. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Anyone else? No? We'll move on to uh, City Council. Okay. So the City Council is page two of the main proposed, uh, proposal document. It is on page one of the annotated and the salary listing is on page one. I don't have page one. I'm sorry, Council, you don't have page one? I don't, I have two. I don't have page one. Should be in Oh, it's page. It's uh, in the salary listing, Councilor. It's um, page one of the salary listing. Is that the one you're missing? Yes. That's okay, I can, I'll follow along. I got page two here, so. So on the main, the main document is page two. Yep. The annotated document is page one and the salary document is page one. Okay. So city manager, I see that uh, we have professional services was uh, deducted $23,000. What was that um, uh, budgeted for? That's for That's your the, uh, audit uh, services and, audit. and we have a new we have a, a, a new audit, audit firm, firm that started in fiscal um, 19 that has a lower bid than our previous company had. Okay. And so that's the reason for that drop. This this will be a um, quote for three years. So we'll see this number at 59,000 next year as well. Okay. The audit, um, just they just started. They started late actually. And with the pandemic, we don't have all of our reports back yet, but we're working that through. We should have that ready in a couple of weeks. But that number is sufficient to cover the auditing costs. Yes, that, that's that's part of their bid. They're not going to change that. And who's the new and audit it, company? Roselli Clark. Roselli Clark and Associates. Did we have them before? 
Yes, a, a while back um, we had them. Not uh, the, the most recent firm was Clifton Larson Allen. Before that was Sullivan Rogers. Before that, I think was um, Rosella okay. Clark. Powers and Thank Sullivan you. were in there too. I'm all set. Anyone else? Yeah. Councilor Leah Robinson put, I'd say we didn't put anything in in regards to conferences. I mean, there are, are a group of us who go to the MMA conference. Yeah, I paid for that out of my budget. I'm sure I'll be okay. You can still go. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an opportunity. To yeah. Council no, I know. I know. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Dunn. Yes. Can you just, uh, I see we got a $500 increase in the longevity account. Yes. Um, you have one person getting that, um, Paul Casino, and he's reached a threshold where, so, so in the exempt exempt uh, agreement, it, mm -hmm. it's modeled after uh, some of the union contracts where over a certain length of time, your mm -hmm. longevity will increase when you reach a certain threshold. I'm not exactly sure what threshold he's at, but he, he qualified for an increase to fourteen hundred from nine hundred. It's a five hundred dollar increase. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I'll say. Okay, so that takes care of the uh, city manager's office and city council's office. Um, it is now six thirty three. Uh, is there another department that you would like to take on right now? Uh, sure. Um, we can go through auditing, or we can go through some of the some of the smaller ones. We the um, uh, interfund transfers. We could do that bottom group of debt service into governmental retirement interfund transfers budget. Let's get through as much of that as we can. Okay. That's so it was expected to be the last stop on. Thursday night. So we're going to take on tonight, uh, right now, uh, from the Thursday evening, uh, the section that was at eight o'clock at night, which was section 710, 711, which was debt service, uh, 820 to 821, intergovernmental affairs, with the cherry sheet, retirement contributions, interfund, and budget reserves. So we'll take that on tonight, seeing that we have a little bit of uh, time. Okay, so the first of those would be the debt, and the debt is on page 48. It's actually two lines, 48 and 49. 48 is the principal portion of the debt, and 49 is the interest portion of the debt. Both of these are going down. This is a function of what we have already on our debt listing and the debt service that is associated with that. There is also, uh, from time to time, an increase in this when we have CIP, for the upcoming year that will add debt. And I think we had made some decisions on that to, to reduce some of the borrowing there and to reduce some of the project. So this million eight on page 48 and the 668 on page 49 represent what the debt service will be for our existing debt in fiscal 21. I just want to add that one of the favorable things driving this number down this year is the fact that if you recall, when we transferred money from that land sales account, we had $7 million. We had to pay off the outstanding debt, which was about uh, $3 million something. And that was costing us $500,000 a year in this principal and interest. So when we paid that off and then transferred the balance to pay for the clock tower and we put the rest in school stabilization, the payoff of that bond really positively affected our bond schedule. That $500,000 payment that was going to last another six years is gone now. And so part of this reduction is a reflection of that. Um, Tom, can I ask a question related to that? This, you know, given the, the where we are um, and haven't paid off those those uh, those loans off, um, having still some reserves, uh, but still approving a CIP and having to issue a bond, 
Will we still, do you think that our bond rating is still in, in a good position and even next year, despite that, um, not going a negative rate, that we will be paying a higher rate or are we still looking okay? You know, it's hard to know what the rating bureaus are going to do in terms of looking at a municipal uh, balance sheet. Everyone is going to be hit so hard. It's possible rating agencies will lower everyone's rating, or they may just, in recognition of COVID, just keep everything the same. I, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, bond, uh, the interest rates were very good. So, uh, you know, bonding would still, it was still a good time for us to go out to bond. We usually go out to bond just about every March on our CIP. This past March was a very good time to go out to bond. Uh, you know, the bond market, I think, is still, well, there was a period where it didn't exist, but I think it made it back. But uh, you know, every year is different. I can't answer the question. There's so many unknowns out there. Would you say that if the economy continues to go in a negative um, direction, that the security of municipal bonds as being a safe place to invest, would the rates continue that? When everything, everyone else is doing poorly, i.e. the private sector, isn't it too fair to say that the bond rates may be going, be more attractive because uh, we are known as the one entity that continues to pay off its bond? Yeah, I think, I think rates will probably continue to be very favorable. The question I was raising is, will that situation negatively impact our bond rating? which means we would pay a higher rate than we otherwise would pay if our rating stayed where it is, which is a pretty favorable rating right now. And I just don't know that. If the economy is really hasn't, hasn't started on the road to recovery by next spring, it could negatively impact our bond. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the rates could the be rates lower, so you're going to drop in. Yeah, it could be a wash, a drop in your rating. You might still get the same rate you would have gotten uh, this year if you're with the same rating you had this year. So there's a lot of unknowns out there nine months from now. Okay. Any uh, next item? Uh, next is, uh, is continuing on the same page order as page 50. In page 51, this is the uh, cherry sheet charges. Um, first page is um, most of the governmental. The second page is the charter school and school choice assessment. These are governor's numbers. Uh, this is the best information that we have at this point. Um, there are some reductions shown and most are increases, small reduction of um, almost 9,000 on SPED. And then on the second page, the school choice assessment, a little bit of a decrease there. So I just want to I just want to be clear on these numbers that we're using. So on the on page fifty, those are precisely the governor's numbers for charges to the city, uh, and I don't think these will change much, uh, regardless of the economy of the state. The second page are the move are the school related numbers. These are guesstimates from me and the school department. These are not the governor's numbers. These govern the governor's numbers for charter school assessment were much, much higher than this because he was giving a lot more money to charter schools, just as he was giving a lot more money to the, to the, the uh, Chelsea public school system. What page is that again, Mr. Manager? I missed the page. The page number, yeah. 51. There's only one page. 50 there. and 51. These are okay, charges. These are charges to the city from the state that show up on the cherry sheet. Okay. So what I was saying is the charges on 50 aren't going to change from the governor's numbers. They're not really dependent upon the economy. The charges on 51 are the school related charges. These are very dependent upon the state of the state's finances. And I've made estimates 
I have not used the governor's numbers because the governor's numbers are way higher than is likely, just as I wouldn't use the governor's chapter 70 numbers. I'm making an estimate as to what these charges might come in at. They're kind of level funded. It doesn't look that way, but after we adopted our budget, there were final chapter 70 numbers that came out. We did a uh, adjustment of the budget in September for the school department. And these proposed 2021 budget numbers are in line with what those final state numbers looked like. And so we went with those. This, these are the exact numbers that the school department built its budget on. I noticed that. And so uh, that's what we're going with. Again, these could change. And if, you know, depending upon what happens with chapter 70, we may have to adjust this budget. Can you explain the, uh, the negative in the RMV non-renewed surcharge? I'm looking at the same thing. So we're looking at a uh, paying Once. less. So we have $178,000 less than the previous years. What is the what does that mean? An RMV non-renewed surcharge. So we get money from the RMV. Uh, I thought this is a payment. We're paying, so we're paying. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that's right. I'm sorry. We're paying the RMV for non we pay them a fee for non renewals that they charge us on the cherry sheet for every time there's some is it a release of a yeah, okay. mark on violations yes they have to release it and they charge us for every time they have to release someone at the RMV from Chelsea who's marked over there they give us a charge and so i think they just look back a year and figure out how much, how many uh, releases that there were that they charged the city for, and they put the number down on the cherry sheet the following year. It was a lot less. So for whatever reason, in, in the year that, you know, I don't know what snapshot they take. I don't know if it's the prior fiscal year, it could be whatever snapshot they take, there were a lot less uh, surcharge, uh, are at the RMV from Chelsea, and so the charge against the city is a precise. We can get. Why that. I'm, trying, I'm just what? trying to figure out why that would be. Yeah, why? Why is the city paying the RMV to release? Yeah, you get charged for every. You get charged. Registry motor vehicle for every every time they have to do some work on a Chelsea vehicle. There's a charge back to the city. Yeah. Yeah. I've never even looked at this in my career, but I imagine it's some statutory. I'm not sure if Patrice will be able to get the information okay. from the state. I can ask her to, to, to inquire. In. Yeah, you get charged for, the, for when you have to release them. So this could be, say, for example, uh, I get a parking ticket in the city of Chelsea and I don't pay it. And because I didn't pay it, at some point, the city of Chelsea sends the RV, a do not allow Roy to register his car right. anywhere we lose registration. Because right. we want to get and to you for your money. And then they say to that individual, to me, they say, go to city of Chelsea first and pay it off. Right. Once they have done that, I get the copy of the receipt that has been paid off to the city of Chelsea. Then I got to go back yeah. to the RMV. And yeah. then the RMV basically says, okay, Chelsea, now that we did do that solid, that payment, we're charging you. Is that the right. process? Is that what I'm thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. I don't think, I think it's just you're, we're paying their administrative work for them to do yeah. because of the city of Chelsea. So they're charging us some administrative fee charge. I don't know the formula. I'm sure it's yeah, you got to pay all your dues. You got to pay all your fines and fees before you can renew your license. Right. It's double work. So can I just, uh, can, Mr. Order. Chairman, Roy, can I just also speak about why is it saying, why is it still saying negative 178, though? Because the previous year they charged us 342,000. Correct. And this year they're saying they're only going to charge us 163. 
So the number of people in, that are going to the IRV seeking that release from Chelsea has gone down by nearly 50%. So what's our actual proposal for 2021? Uh, well, that's, that's the number. Charge is 163,000. But that's not 163. what it says here. It's, that's 163,280. Okay. It says 163. That's what the proposal is this year? Yes. Okay. yes. Wow. Okay, that's hefty increase. Decrease. The decrease. 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 They're charging us less this year. We're saving that money. Well, we uh, we haven't spent the three forty two. We haven't spent two sixty of the three forty two today. I mean, they so yeah, they charge less this yeah. year too. Beautiful. Uh, is that the same? Uh, so yeah. I'm sorry. Can I just finish up my question? Is that the same with the special ed? No, um, what I was saying was we spent so far in fiscal 20, we've spent less than the 342 that was budgeted in 20. We spent 260 on this line. So they only charged us back of this 342. We haven't been charged this whole amount. This year. Right, no, but I was speaking. Because the estimate was off. Yeah. They're yeah. not getting as many people, so 30, which is why they have reduced it for FY20. And then 30, 30, the additional 30,000 was appropriated for. Or what was budgeted? Is that money going to go back into free cash? If there's a surplus on the overall line, so you have to look yeah. at the whole line, yeah. and not just the individual okay. line in it. You have to look I, at the whole thing. I have one other question on the charter school assessment. And just correct me if I'm wrong. The, 50, the fifteen million thirteen thousand two hundred thirty-six. That's for every Chelsea resident who is attending any charter school. Correct. So each student that goes to charter school, whatever our cost is, automatically goes to the charter school. Yeah. And we always end up getting reimbursed. For but but it's for it's for. But but that reimbursement goes on for several years per student. It's a re I in a diminishing in a diminishing yeah. used to be a five still, year I'm not still sure. paid even after the students left school. Correct. Yeah. We're not at the full amount of money we should be in. Correct. We're not. They've always underfunded that account. So you even though the no, I understand, but that's not a that, that that's not a function of. Of, of the law that's a function of the legislature under right. funding. Correct. Right. So that, the, the real problem is with the, is with the legislature. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions from uh, counselors? No, sir. Retirement controversy. Yes, the retirement. Uh, Going on to the retirement fund. Have 10 minutes, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I'm sorry, what is page, no. oh, page 53. Page, page 53. 53 and uh, just page 53. So the uh, contributory pensions is the largest number there, the $9 million. That comes from Act. We, we are assessed each year a value from the uh, retirement uh, agency, and that is our assessment, the 9069409 for fiscal 21. Uh, several years ago, we went to a single payment option rather than twice a year, and we saved some money by doing that. So we anticipate continuing with that into the future. The smaller line, the non-contributory pensions, $11,000, that is our contribution for one retiree pre-World War II who is in their 90s that we continue to pay for, and that will eventually uh, reduce. But for now, it's it's budgeted uh, about the same as the year before, just a little bit higher. Uh, other questions on the retirement department? Anyone? Questions on the retirement? What age do you retire? What? I'm sorry, say again? What age do you retire? Who retires? Can anybody retire after 20 years? Uh, 
Well, yes, but it depends on your, the time that you have worked with the city and the how old you are, how many years you've been with the city, how old you are. And there's a formula for that. So the retirement director can probably advise better on what the percentage would be that you receive every time. When they count the last three? I don't think they do that anymore. Um, Depends on what year you were hired. For new employees, it's an average of your highest five, I think. Mm -hmm. For old employees, pre-2009. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, top three. <laughs> yeah. And then the safeguards and the statutes against um, retiring after you get a big bump in pay. Possibility of this. Oh, one more question I want to ask you. Well, we had the meeting last time with Mr. Ambrosino, if I remember correctly, about when they retire, the city doesn't pick up kids, but they're going to go directly. The city's going to pay for them to go under Medicaid. So, this is program? Yes, yeah, so that is new this year, but we can talk about that when we talk about group health insurance. But all retirees now, if they're 65, are being moved to Medicare. Yes, and the city is picking up the penalty cost for those people who don't have enough quarters to do that. What if, the one, what if they don't want to go? They have to go. They don't have any choice. So does that affect the employees that are being hired now or all the employees that retire? Every employee, whoever retires, once they reach 65, will be moved to Medicare. So you don't pick up the time no more? The city does pick up. I have the health insurance from the city. We'll have Medicare. We'll have Medicare. The city pays part A and the penalty, and the employee pays part B. Is, is that a savings to the city that way? It's a significant savings to the city, yes. So I can do this next one. This is, uh, if you want to do this one more. Uh, we do have to shut down. Uh, shut down. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll okay. pick it up. We have, we have about five. Yeah, we have five minutes. We have to cut between the Okay. Right. Well, yeah, because yeah. Ricky needs a little more time. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll be back on in five minutes. Please use your city council link for the meeting, not the budget. So you have to log off and log back on. Sorry for the problem. Thank uh you. -huh.